This video is on the geometry of transition metal complexes. We've seen uh, in class that they can adopt the same kinds of geometry we saw before when we talked about molecules, trigonal planar, all the way to octahedral. Uh, this uh, video is only going to talk about the new one, the square planar, uh, which has uh, four ligands attached to coordinate covalent bonds to a transition metal. Uh, in contrast that to the expected case in which the four ligands are attached uh, to the transition metal in a tetrahedral uh, fashion. To understand um, the difference between these two cases, we have to go back and look a little bit at the uh, the orbitals. And if you remember that, uh, in the, at least in um, in the terms of the three D orbitals, there's five of them: uh, dx squared, y squared, dxy, dxc, dyz, and dz squared. And this is their relative shape. Uh, the axes are also shown along here, and you can see they're bilobular, except for this one, which is quite like a dumbbell shape with this uh, sort of red in the in the middle. Um, so we're going to look at uh, basically the orientations of these orbitals on the transition metal. That's where the 3D orbitals will be. Uh, and how when a ligand comes in to interact with the transition metal, uh, that we can effectively change the energies of these orbitals uh, in a way that will uh, lead to, in this case, a tetrahedral or square planar geometry. Let's look again at some of these orbitals. Let's look at, for instance, this one, the dxy. And if you look with the xy axis is here, you see the green and the red. You can see these lobes are in between the xy axis. They're not oriented directly along either the x or y, but the lobes are oriented in between the axes. Uh, now that's different in the case of the dx squared minus y, in which you see these two blue lobes are located directly along the x axis, and the two red ones are located directly along the y axis. Um, all of these orbitals, except for this one, the dx squared minus y squared, and this one, the dz squared, in which this basic blue lobe is oriented along the z-axis, all the rest of these, uh, the lobes are in between the axes and not aligned directly, uh, directly along the axis. And that's really important in the next slide. You remember from our earlier conversations earlier in the semester that all these orbitals would essentially have the same energy, um, the, all these different uh, 3D orbitals. But what might happen, let's say there were electrons in these orbitals, if a ligand that's going to bring in a pair of electrons to form a coordinate covalent bond actually approaches along one of these axes. Uh, for instance, uh, let's look at this one. And Let's look at this one. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. Uh, I think you can see that the uh, the lobes are oriented directly along the xy axis. Pretend there's electrons in this orbital. So if a ligand were to approach with its own electrons along this x axis or along this y axis, while well, I have electrons here and electrons here, they're going to repel. So we've seen before that through Coulomb's law that when opposite charges get together, they attract and lower the energy. If I had a pair of electrons here and electrons here, they would raise the energy of this orbital compared to the other orbitals. Um, and especially if the, uh, the, uh, the ligands come directly along the x-y axis, uh, this, would be, this orbital's energy would be raised a lot. In contrast, this one would be raised, uh, oops, in contrast, if I brought a ligand with uh, electrons in it along the axis here for the dxy. You see these lobes are not located directly along the xy axis, but in between them. Uh, so its energy, their energies would also be raised as we brought in along the uh, xy axis. And that's what you'd expect for a square planar complex. The ligands would or orient and come in along the xy axis. So we can see that if that were to happen, these two orbitals would be ra raised in energy, the dx squared minus y squared, and the dxy. These have fewer contributions due to the y. This has the dxc. Uh, this is the dyz, no contribution from the x, and the dz squared. So these are going to be lower in energy. So when we started with five orbitals of similar energy, now we have two that are going to be higher in energy, and then we have three other ones. Let's look at their actual energy. This uh, slide shows, again, the approach of uh, basically uh, ligands with electrons along the xy axis. And you can sort of visualize it this way. This shows that in between the two axes or directly along the axes. And I think you can see that 
the ones that had XY contributions would be raised a lot in energy, particularly this one in which the lobes were uh, directly oriented on the XY axis. So this would be raised, you start off with 5D orbitals of the same energy. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be split in energy so that this one is the highest in energy now because when the electrons came in on the ligand, it was raised to the highest energy level. Uh, then this would be a little less than that because that's just the DXY. Remember those lobes are off axis but still along the XY plane. Uh, and the ones down here would obviously be lower and en lowest energy. So this slide shows again for uh, the square planar case in which I'm bringing ax uh, the orbitals, I mean the uh, ligands in on along the X and Y axes, that these two orbitals are going to be higher in energy and these would be lower. Again, these are the ones that were oriented most directly along the X, Y axis. Now, in contrast, if I looked at a tetrahedral case and we're bringing electrons in, already in a tetrahedral case, um, uh, these are essentially off axis to start. So uh, the orbitals that are off axis in terms of the orientation of their lobes are going to be in higher energy and the ones that are directly on the axes, in the case of a tetrahedron, along the xy axis are going to be lower in energy. So you can see that uh, how when we bring ligands in either a tetrahedral or sort of a square planar geometry to a central transition metal complex, and here's palladium in both cases, that we split these orbitals, in the orbitals into two sets of energies. Uh, sets that are lower in energy and sets that are higher in energy. Now we can ask the question, why is the uh, DA complexes like palladium often found in uh, the square planar geometry? Well, let's start putting electrons in here. If we have eight electrons, D electrons, to populate these D orbitals in palladium, we put two here, two here, two here. These are low in energy. And then two here. This is higher in energy. And we'll find out later that this is actually called an anti-bonding orbital. Yet, if it was a tetrahedral real arrangement, I would put two here, two here, and I'd have another four to go. I'd put one, two, three, four. So you see, these four electrons would be in higher energy orbitals, uh, and plus I'd have unpaired electrons compared to more. So the paired and uh, electrons or orbitals are really a lower energy in the tet in the square planar case. Hence. When we have eight electrons, because this can be filled and the overall sum of the energy is less, that's what's preferred. So we have preferred the square planar over the tetrahedral. It turns out there's a lot of factors that are involved that are both electronic on the ligand, what are the kind of uh, ligand electrons are brought in, and steric factors in terms of the size of the metal ion in the ligand. Let's consider a D8 complex, which has got a plus two charge. Uh, nickel is in, uh, you can tell, in this um, period, um, row four of the periodic table here. Uh, and it's smaller. As we go down, this would be larger, so it's small. Because nickel is so small, steric factors are going to be important. So the ligands that are coming in will probably want to be tetrahedrally oriented, even though it's a D8, because uh, it's pretty crowded around a small uh, metal ion like this. Uh, however, uh, this can change, because if there is... If we have electrons that are really um, what we call electron donating, they really like to be donated. Here's an example, a CH3 with a lone pair. Here's overall negative charge on here. This carbon is not electronegative, so these, this lone pair with a minus charge on the carbon is uh, very unstable, so it likes to be donated. Uh, that coming in, it can actually, as close as a small ligand, uh, this can actually adopt square planar complexes with nickel. So a couple of factors are involved. So in summary, we talked about uh, how uh, D8 um, transition uh, metals can form square plane or tetrahedral complexes. There are both steric and electronic considerations. Uh, if the ion is really small, you would might expect tetrahedral because that way you want to get all these ligands as far apart as possible in electron clouds connecting them to the transition metals. Uh, but again, uh, the electrons, if they're coming in and strongly interacting with the metal D orbitals, will change the energy of these orbitals and make their energy differences huge. And we can put electrons in lower energy levels um, if we can put them into the square planar uh, D orbitals, uh, and that would all overall uh, lead to more stability. Uh, so it's more complicated than the simple arrangement of uh, four clouds coming out of a central atom forming a molecule, as we discussed before.